All right. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on when you're listening to this. Obviously, I'm not there, uh, and I am sure that I am missing you. I'm recording this on Wednesday night. Uh, you are hopefully or willing watching this on Monday, uh, and I should be right now, if all goes according to plan, I should be all headed back from Dallas for my sister-in-law's wedding. Uh, and so I can tell you that I'm, I hate missing school. I love my job. I love you guys. And I'm eager to be back with you on Tuesday. Uh, but for today, we'll do this via video. So if you guys could go ahead and stand up for me, please. All right. So our devotion today is Psalm 19, verse 14. And the psalmist writes, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So this is the word of the Lord. I'm sure you said thanks be to God. You guys can have a seat. So I want us to look back here at these last five words, my rock and my redeemer. Now, when I say rock, uh, you likely, if you're thinking like in a biblical point of view, you're probably thinking like, oh, because like, God is like our sure foundation. And, you know, he's solid like a rock. And, and there's certainly, that's absolutely true. Praise God. But remember that this is a Psalm of David. And for David, a rock was not just a secure place to build. A rock was a hiding place from your enemies. Remember that David was chased by Saul over and over again. And over and over again, David would hide in caves in the cliffs. And so the rock God as a rock means that God is our refuge. God is our hiding place from our enemies. But he's more than that. He's also our redeemer. Right? He has purchased us from slavery to sin. He has rescued us from death. And we get to live in his presence forever. And I don't know what your Monday's been like so far, but that is really good news. The God of the universe invites you to come and hide in him and has promised you that he will redeem you from slavery to sin and bring you to himself for all of eternity. So let's pray and praise God for that truth. So bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. But you are our hiding place. You are the safe, secure spot that we can find refuge from a crazy and chaotic world. Help us to run to you. Help us to reject all other offers of security. None of them can compare to you. Lord, we also praise you because you are our redeemer. You've rescued us through the blood of your son, Jesus. You have purchased us with the blood of your son, Jesus, and made us a people for yourselves. God, I pray that you would bless us today as we study your word. Give us wisdom and help us see clearly in the book of Kings what you want us to see. We ask all this in your name. Amen. All right, friends, go ahead and open up uh, in your memory verse sheet. If you don't already have it open, open it up to Psalm 51. Let's take a look at verse 17. So this is our new verse, our, our trio of new verses as we bring Psalm 51 uh, to a close. So let's say Psalm 51, verse 17 together three times. One, two, three. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. So we said last time uh, that really 16 and 17 are linked together. So after David's sin with Bathsheba and Uriah and David's forgiveness from God, he prays and says that he knows that ultimately what God wants is not you know a dead ox on an altar. What God wants is a, a person to be broken over their sin, to not just regret that you were caught, but regret deeply that you sin in the first place. What God wants is a broken and contrite, a humble, repentant heart. And if we offer those up to God, whether we have a bull or an ox or a pigeon or nothing at all, if we can offer God a broken and contrite heart, then God is pleased with that sacrifice. So when we sin, let us grieve deeply our sin. Let us hate the sin that we have done to our Lord, and let's humble ourselves before him. Let's say verse 18 together three times. One, two, three. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. So well, let's look at verse 18 and 19 together. So let's say verse 19 three times. Here we go. One, two, three. 
Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. So that, sorry, that should, that T, which I don't know why it's so teeny tiny, uh, should be normal. There you go. Then bulls. All right. Two more times. One, two, three. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Now, I love this because at the end of his prayer, and this has been a prayer of personal confession. David is the one who sinned. But at the end of this prayer of personal confession, David then broadens his horizons and he prays for the people around him. Right? He prays that God would do good to Zion or Jerusalem and that God would protect and build up the walls to, to protect Jerusalem. That way, the sacrifices could be offered, burnt offerings and whole offerings. The people can worship God in freedom, peace, and security. This is what David prays for. And so I think the same for us, guys, that yes, when we have sinned, let us give ourselves over to sin, the prayers of confession, but let us not become so inwardly focused that we forget to pray for the people around us, that, that God has put in our life so that we will pray for one another, right? That, who knows what blessing God has for me that I'm only going to get when Davis Franklin prays for me. And until Davis prays for me, I can't get that blessing. And so I, I pray for Davis and I pray that he would pray for me so that I could get the blessing that God wants to give me through Davis's prayers. So let's say 17 through 19 together once. One, two, three. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Do good design in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. All right, let's say 14 through 19 once. One, two, three. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. <clears throat> All right, so go ahead and take out your king's outline and open that up to page 25. So if you have forgotten your king's outline, I don't want you to leave class. I want you to take out a piece of notebook paper, and I want you just to write the blanks in order, and you can fill those in uh, later today at school A or when you get home. So everybody stay in class together. So we are looking at the book of Kings because we believe with all of our heart that the Bible is breathed out and inspired by God and is therefore profitable for us. We also believe with all of our heart that the Bible is not just a random collection of stories, but a unified story that points us to Jesus, who he is and what he's done. And so we study God's word every day with a humble expectation that God will bless us through his word, and he blesses us by showing us the beauty of Jesus Christ. So we are looking at the book of Kings, and we are looking at the third theme in the book of Kings, evaluating the kings in light of the covenant. And what we spent time on Wednesday of, of last week for you guys uh, was showing how when Kings begins, the author of Kings makes it very obvious how things in Israel, at the beginning anyway, are going according to God's promises in the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenants. The people of Israel are a huge nation. They're living in their land. They're being ruled by a king. They're blessing their neighbors. The line of David continues despite their failures because of God's promise to David. So those two covenants are in absolutely in full effect. But the big one, the big one that we need to understand is the Mosaic covenant. So we looked at echoes of the Abrahamic and Davidic covenant. Now let's look at, so I'm on page 25, blank 322. Let's look at, here's your blank, echoes of the, sorry, this is your blank, Mosaic. Echoes of the Mosaic, M-O-S-A-I-C, old covenants. So it's the Mosaic covenant that gives the reader the primary lens for understanding the book of Kings. Now, this connection between the Mosaic Covenant and the book of Kings is made explicitly when Solomon is told by his father David, he reigns under Yahweh. So he says to Solomon, he is to keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes 
his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Now, these words should remind us of Deuteronomy 17. The king of Israel is to be a man of the book. The king of Israel is himself a man under God's authority. The king is not meant to replace Yahweh. Right? He's not to rule instead of Yahweh. He's to represent and rule under Yahweh. What the king of Israel is supposed to do above all else is he is supposed to demonstrate for the people, this is what it looks like to have Yahweh at the center of your life. So Deuteronomy 17 tells every king of Israel to do the following. When he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them. This is what God's people are all to do, but the king is to demonstrate it in living color. So the author of Kings wants you to understand this book in light of the Mosaic Covenant, the standards, the rules, the commands, the blessings and the curses of the Mosaic Covenant. So for example, when Solomon prays to dedicate the temple in 1 Kings 8, his prayer is basically praying out all of the promises of blessing and the warnings of curses in the Mosaic Covenant. Towards the end of the book of Kings, when the good king Josiah finds the lost book of the law in 2 Kings, which is almost certainly the book of Deuteronomy is what he finds, he leads the nation in a covenant reform movement. And in fact, these, after Josiah dies, these are the parting words the author of Kings records for him. Before him, before Josiah, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his might, according to all the law of Moses. The author of Kings wants you to know, you, you want to know what it looks like when you're all in for God? You live according to the law of Moses. Your life lines up with the Ten Commandments. Right? No one loved God like Josiah. And this has been the, the model all along, right? Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. This is, again, the command for every Israelite, not just the king. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Now, one final way the book emphasizes the connection with the Mosaic Covenant is the allusions. I don't mean not illusions with an I, but allusions with an A, like a, a reference, a subtle reference to the breaking of the, uh, shall we say, the forbidden four of Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 17. So what in the world is the forbidden four? The forbidden four are the four big no-nos for every Israelite king. It says in Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 17, like this. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers, you shall set his king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. So there's the first of the forbidden four. No foreigners. Two, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. So that's the second one. Military power as represented by horses and chariots. Three, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. So three, there's not multiple wives, and four, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. So the forbidden four, here we go. First, the king must not be a, here's your blank, foreigner. Now, non-Israelites are welcome to join the people of Israel, but a non-Israelite is not to be the king over Israel. Second, the king must not acquire many horses. Again, horses, uh, sorry to anybody who loves horses, there's nothing wrong with horses, obviously. But horses and chariots represented trusting in military might instead of God, and God's people were not to do that. Third of the forbidden four, the king must not acquire many, here's your blank, wives. Now, obviously, a large part of what would drive a king to acquire many wives was just sexual sin. Like, let's just be honest. But in the ancient world, you would marry different women to secure alliances with their fathers. 
So by Solomon having all of those wives, yes, it was because he was given over to sexual sin, but it was also because he was trying to form alliances with his neighbors and thus seek security, not from God, but from alliances. And God's people are to trust in God. The fourth of, of the forbidden four, the king must not acquire much gold. And this is quite simply materialism. Our hope is not in silver or gold. Our hope is in the faithfulness of God. Now, the first rule was never broken. There was never a legitimate king in Judah, or really the northern king, uh, that wasn't an Israelite. But Kings, the book of Kings, shows us how often the individual kings broke rules two through four. Now, let's just take Solomon for an example. Uh, we don't read about Solomon fighting battles, but here's what we do read. 1 Kings 10.26, And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king of Israel, our king in Jerusalem. And it also tells us in 1 Kings 10 that Solomon got these horses and chariots from Egypt. So he sent the people back to Egypt, which God explicitly forbade in Deuteronomy 17. Now we know about Solomon's marital life, right? He married many foreign women, forming alliances with many kings, and it was a disaster. 1 Kings 11, 8, 1 through 8. Now Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after the Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and then after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all of his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed to their gods. So Solomon breaks the second of the forbidden four, the third of the forbidden four, and we'll talk about the fourth of the forbidden four after our three-minute break.
right, what a terrible sound. So let's come back together. <clears throat> We're looking at the forbidden four. No foreigner is to rule Israel. No Israelite king is to marry many foreign women. No Israelite king is to rely on military power. And no Israelite king is to accumulate much wealth for himself. So we see now Solomon, he didn't break the first rule. He is an Israelite, but he broke rule number two and rule number three. What about rule number four? Well, Solomon is not only known as the wisest man who ever lived. He's also known as one of the wealthiest men who ever lived. And where did he get that wealth from? Well, in one, one perspective, he got it from God. When God asked Solomon, what do you want me to give to you? Solomon answered, well, he said, give me wisdom. And so God says, I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. So God is a generous giver and he gives to Solomon great wealth, but Solomon abuses his God-given wealth. And he does this, he forces Israelites to work in work gangs to build his ever larger and larger building projects, including, horrifically enough, religious structures for the worship of false gods. First Kings 9.15, and this is the account of the forced labor that King Solomon drafted to build the house of the Lord and his own house and the Milo and the wall of Jerusalem and Hazer and Megiddo and Gezer. But then it goes on to add, then Solomon built a high place. Now Solomon didn't build this himself. He didn't go out there with a shovel. He forced Israelites to go and build an altar for a false god. And he did this not just once or twice, but for all of his foreign wives to make sacrifices to their gods. So he abuses his wealth and power and builds these just gaudy monstrosities of palaces and altars for false gods. It is interesting if you read carefully in Kings it describes the building of the temple, and then it says at the very end of that chapter, now Solomon spent seven years building the temple of the Lord. And the next chapter begins, and it describes Solomon's own palace, and it says Solomon spent 13 years building his own palace. And they don't make, the author doesn't make a comment, but you, the reader, are supposed to notice that, that wait, Solomon spent almost twice as long on his own house than he did for the house of God? Isn't that a haven't we messed up our priorities? Yes. Yes, we have at this point. Solomon's priorities have shifted from the honor of the Lord to his own glory and fame. Now, the tragic story of Solomon is retold in the story of Ahab. And anyway, we've talked about him a good bit because Kings talks about him a good bit. Now, Ahab is actually one of those rare biblical characters who is talked about outside of the Bible. Like other cultures, the Syrians, the Assyrians mention Ahab. And Ahab is actually well known in the ancient world as a very successful general. But in the Bible, both his successes and failures, as we've already seen, are attributed to Yahweh. So think about the forbidden four in, in the terms of Ahab's life. First, Ahab married Jezebel. She was a Phoenician princess, so a non-Israelite, and she worshipped Baal. And the Bible seems pretty clear that it's Ahab's marriage to Jezebel that brought about his ruin. So, for example, here's what Jezebel does. First, she introduced Baal worship to Israel. 1 Kings 16, and as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So Ahab, like every other Israelite king, was leading the people to worship Yahweh, but worshiping Yahweh at these golden altars. As if that was no big deal. Ahab added to his sins by marrying Jezebel and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So Jezebel worshipped Baal and she led Ahab to worship Baal. Jezebel is the one who murders Yahweh's prophets. So 1 Kings 18, it says, And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So it's not Ahab who murders Yahweh's prophets during this time. It's Jezebel. She also is the one who persecuted the prophet Elijah. Elijah, when he's, there's no other word for it, complaining to God. He says, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars and they've killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only I am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And we know that, uh, that Elijah is praying this because after he brought down fire from Mount Carmel, <clears throat> he brought about the death of the prophets of Baal. And Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you for that. 
And that's why Elijah goes on the run. We also see that Jezebel, the book of Kings, she had innocent people murdered out of greed. So there's an interesting story in 1 Kings 21. Basically, Ahab wants to buy his neighbor's garden and his neighbor won't sell it to him. Well, it's his neighbor's vineyard and his neighbor won't sell it to him. And so Ahab is sulking because he's kind of a baby and he didn't get his way. And we read this. But Je Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food? And he said to her, because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, give me your vineyard for money, or else if it please you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And Jezebel's wife said to him, do you now govern Israel? Arise and eat bread. Let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And she does by having Naboth murdered. Remember how we talked about Solomon's wealth? Well, Solomon, it says, had an ivory throne. 1 Kings 10, 18 through 20. The king also made a great ivory throne and overlaid it with the finest gold. The throne had six steps and the throne had a round top. And on each side of the seat were armrests and two lions standing beside the armrests. With 12 lions stood there, one on each side of a step on the six steps. The like of it was never made in any kingdom. Yeah. Ivory palace. Ivory throne. That's pretty nice. How about an ivory palace? Because that's what Ahab built for himself. Now, the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did and the ivory house that he built and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? This was an amazingly expensive proposition, but this is Ahab. Marries foreign women, trusts in military power, and trusts in wealth. Now, despite all of that, all that he had going for him, all of his money, all of his power, Ahab was miserable. And he actually murdered that guy Naboth to get even more because it's never enough. It's never enough. First Kings 21, right? This is the story we just talked about. Naboth won't sell it. Jezebel has him murdered. And it says, and as soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money for Naboth is not alive, but dead. And as soon as Ahab had heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab, Ahab arose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. So these same temptations that faced the Israelite kings, trusting in money, trusting in your own strength, trusting in your friendships, trusting in anything but God, they are still with us today. But if we read the Bible rightly, we will see a warning. Because within a few years of Solomon's death, all of that money and wealth that he had acquired was gone. Well, Solomon had been dead for years, so he wasn't enjoying it. But even the, the money that he left behind him, Egypt invaded and took it all away. So what I would say to you, and I, I would say this to myself, is beware the temptation that we all face to find meaning and security apart from God. Wealth, possessions, power, these things don't last and neither do people who hope in them. If your hope is not in God, your hope will fail, and so will you. Psalm 37 puts it like this. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Right? So here are the wicked lurking, ready to pounce. But what happens to them? Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. Psalm 49 puts it like this. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. As the old saying goes, there's no U-Haul trailers behind a hearse. You truly can't take it with you. Now we're talking about the covenant and how the kings are evaluated against the covenant. So let's talk about the covenant. Here's your blank. Failure. The covenant failure of the kings of Israel and Judah. So I hope that after kind of hammering this point for the last couple of days, that we have made pretty certain the connection between the covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the book of Kings. And this will help us understand the downward spiral and the destruction of Israel. So remember, this book was written to answer a question. And the question was being asked from exile. And the question was this. If we are God's people, how did we end up in exile? And here's the answer. Because you broke the covenant. 
Solomon's failure with his wives and his money and his power was ultimately a breach of the covenant. First Kings 11, therefore the Lord said to Solomon, since this, worshiping false gods, trusting in your money, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant, I will tear the kingdom from you. Solomon failed to keep the covenant. The people's rebellion during the time of Ahab was seen as the same. What did Elijah say when he prayed to God? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, but the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. And since they've rejected the covenant, they've thrown down God's altars, they killed his prophets with the sword. They're completely rejecting God. Second King says that the exile, the driving away of Israel and then Judah from the promised land was because they broke the covenant. The king of Assyria in 722, when he conquered the northern kingdom, carried the Israelites away to Assyria and put them in Halal and on the, the Haber, the river of Gozan, and, and in the cities of the Medes. Right? They're carried away and put in foreign lands. Why? Because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant, even all that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded. They neither listened nor obeyed. So you remember where we started off talking about how things were at the beginning of Solomon's reign? Massive nation, enjoying peace and prosperity, being a blessing to all. By the end of the book, the reign of Solomon is a distant memory. They're no longer a massive nation. They've been reduced to a pitifully small number. Many are in exile. They're not in the promised land. They're not ruled by an Israelite king. They're ruled by cruel foreign kings. There's no blessing anywhere. So how is God going to keep his promises? How is he going to keep his promises to Abraham to bless the world through his family? How is he going to keep his promises to David to bring a royal deliverer from his line? How is he going to keep his promises to Adam and Eve to bring a snake-crushing king to undo the effects of sin? This is a crisis. And though there is a crisis, as displayed in the book of Kings, there is no doubt which party is the guilty one. It's the sustained rebellion of the people, initiated and led by the kings, that brings about their exile from the land. So that brings us, for our last three or four minutes, to our fourth theme in the book of First and Second Kings. The author of First and Second Kings wants to give hope for kingdom, here's your blank, restoration. For kingdom restoration beyond exile. So the book ends, and they're in exile. And by the end of the book, the people of Israel have lost their first, here's your blank, land. They've lost their land. So they're not in the promised land anymore. They've lost their leadership. All the king, all the descendants of David are either dead or in prison. There's no Davidic king anymore. They've lost their, here's your blank, temple. The temple, the, what you know, the center of Israel, the, where God's presence was on earth, has been destroyed and burned to the ground. And they've lost their freedom. They are now slaves of the Babylonians, slaves of the Assyrians, slaves of the Persians, of the Greeks, the Romans. They've lost everything. And all of this because of their repeated covenant violations. And we've been talking about David's family quite a bit. And let's end <clears throat> today with two final stories from David's family. The first story highlights the negative influence of David's family on the people. Right? As the leader goes, so go the people. And when David's family goes astray, the results are disastrous. So in 2 Kings 20, 25, 22 and 26, we read this. So the Babylonians have conquered Jerusalem. They've taken the people off into exile, and they put a governor in charge. He's a, he's a, he's a Hebrew, and he's actually a good guy. And things look like maybe there's a glimmer of hope. It says this, And over the people who remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left, he appointed Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, son of Shaphan, governor. Now, when all the captains and their men heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah governor, they came with their men to Gedaliah at Mizpah, namely Ishmael, the son of Nathana, and Jehonan, the son of Kariah, and Sariah, the son of Tanhumath, the Netophahite, and Jazaniah, the son of the Machathite. And Gedaliah swore to them and their men, saying, Do not be afraid because the Chaldean officials live in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. But in the seventh month, Ishmael, the son of Nethana, the son of Elishma, of the royal family, of the family of David, came with ten men and struck down Gedaliah and put him to death, along with the Jews and Chaldeans who were with him at Mizpah. Then all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the forces arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. 
So Jerusalem has been destroyed. And the one glimmer of hope and peace for the Israelite people is this guy, Gedaliah. And a group of rebels led by a man from the line of David kills this guy, leads the people to flee to Egypt. Remember, Egypt is the place of slavery. They aren't supposed to go back that way. I mean, this is what God said in Deuteronomy 17, right? Don't cause the people to return to Egypt. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And the prophet Jeremiah, who was actually involved in all of these events, warning people, he says about people who want to run to, Israel, run to Egypt, he says, Hear the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, If you set your faces to enter Egypt and you go to live there, then the sword that you fear shall overtake you in the land of Egypt, and the famine of which you are afraid shall follow you to Egypt, and there you shall die. So God's family was leading people. So David's family. David's family is leading people into the grave. This is how Israel ended up destroyed in exile because of the failure of David's family. God, thankfully, is not done with the nation of Israel. And when we come back on Tuesday, Lord willing, we'll close with that final story from the family of David that shows us how God is still working to bring about the fulfillment of his purposes. So your homework for this evening is 1 Samuel chapter 22 through 24. Read, annotate, and summarize it, and you'll turn that in tomorrow before class. Love you guys. See you, Lord willing, tomorrow.